Now then, I'm going to show you a few things here. Anybody know where this place is? Seattle. Oh, that's clever. <laughs> Seattle, Washington. Who can name, I wonder, some of the companies that started in Seattle. Some of them have their headquarters here. This is one. Do you know, this is just an assembly plant. They used to have their headquarters here. They've not moved to, uh, uh, to Chicago in 2001. But that is the Boeing Ooh. assembly plant, where they assemble some of their... Um, planes. This one, Seattle is the headquarters of Microsoft. And for all you people who don't like Costa Coffee, it's also the headquarters of Starbucks. <laughs> Seattle is the home of Seattle Seahawks, which is the uh, football team, and Seattle Mariners, basketball team. Who has heard of this place? It's called Pike's Place fish market. Not heard of it? No. It's world famous. Can we have a video? Please. Jim. Notice that we can make a difference for people. Like when they come by, they leave in a better mood. And a lot of people have told us that we made their day. Nice. <laughs> a customer came up to me and said it was the best fish they'd ever had. Something happened to me, and I realized I was making people happy. Give me a big hug. This gave me a plus in my life, and I love serving the people now. Excuse the type. Psych, made you look. The fish philosophy is about engaging people and creating positive change in their workplaces and home lives. Too much coffee! Too much coffee! You know, are you being, this is a lousy stinking job, or are we being, well, we're just selling fish, or are you being, you know, world famous? Play pieces! Play pieces. You know, you're going to do something differently when you're being world famous than you are if you're being impatient. The fish philosophy embodies an entire way of life. You don't have to throw fish. You just have to have the energy. You have to have the commitment. You have to have fun. You have to have fun at work. Do I ever miss? It's a simple choice. That's all it is. I have it. <clears throat> now, the title of the message this morning is... Um, this is not about fish. <laughs> now I know that when Joel does stuff, okay, he's been off the wall now. I don't know where he gets it from. But <laughs> as a different slant on things. But this is not about fish. Okay, who recognizes this symbol? Yeah? Right. The fish symbol, according to tradition, during the persecution by the Roman Empire in the first few centuries after Christ, Christians used the fish symbol to mark meeting places and tombs or to distinguish friend from foe. According to one story, when a Christian met a stranger on the road, the Christians sometimes drew just one ark of fish in the dirt. If the stranger knew what he was talking about and drew the other ark, both believers knew they were in good company. Mm. Now, ichthus. How many Greeks are here? I know a little Greek, you got a restaurant in, uh, in Murtha. <laughs> but Greeks. Ichthus is made up of the Greek letters. Ichthus means fish in Greek, okay? And it's made up of these little uh, letters, Greek letters, Iodro, Chai, Theta, Upsilon, and Sigma. They are encrusted for Jesus Christus, Theo, Iosote, which is simply Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Now, there are many stories about fish in the Bible. Some of Jesus' disciples have been fishermen, a number of them. They've been fishing for fish which is what you normally do when you're fishing. You fish for fish. But one day, Jesus said something interesting to Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. He says in Matthew 4, verse 19, in the New Living Translation, he says, Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. The message says, I will make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women. So that's the tie-up this morning, okay? The stuff that's going on in the world-famous Pike Place fish market is not just about fish, it's about life and about reaching people. Did you get that? Yeah. And I believe that they are just tapping in 
to principles that are found in the Bible without even knowing it. But when biblical principles are in place, God responds to his word. And I remember a guy, um, he was out in Malaysia, preaching out in Malaysia, and uh, when he came back, he was talking to us, we had him at the church doing a mission thing, and um, he was saying he was there, and uh, he'd been to the church, and, and so on, and then on Friday night, there was a knock at the door, he was staying with the pastor of the church, knock on the door, and uh, the pastor got up, went to the door, and he came back, and uh, the guy said, well, who was that? He said, oh, he's the local butcher. He said, oh, yeah, what was he there for then? He says, you remember your church? No, he's not a member, he said, but uh, what was he doing? He was bringing his business tithe. He said, what for? So he has found that he gives one-tenth of his income to God. God blesses his business. <laughs> Tapping into a principle without even realizing the principle was there. Now, the principles that we're looking at this morning, they are principles that work in life and should be evident in the 21st century church. Pike Clay's fish market has become world famous for selling fish. Now we're not selling anything, but we are giving people the opportunity to discover and enjoy the greatest gift ever given, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, and we at Oasis, listen, can become world famous for doing that. Amen. I'm serious, not being boastful, I'm just telling you this, this is the truth. The apostle wrote to the church in Thessalonica, we are going to go back into this. And he told him in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 to 8, you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. In other words, and this is what I like to think about it, is that they were doing what church should be doing. And that model had reached far beyond their immediate area of influence. I think we can learn a bit about reaching people by looking closely at the principles that are adopted by the fish philosophy. Just remember, this is not about fish. <coughs> this is about life. All aspects of life, including church life. You didn't notice the four steps of the fish philosophy. Play. Make their day. Be there. Choose your attitude. <laughs> Let's have a look at this individually. As we grow older, we can lose our sense of fun. <laughs> that was correct, boy. <laughs> As we get older, we can lose our sense of fun. Remember when you were little kids? You used to enjoy things, laughing all the time. We get older, we get serious. I don't think we should ever get old, too old to play. There's still a little boy or a little girl in all of us. We just need to allow that childlike character to rise up. You see, when Jesus uh, went, went to Jairus' daughter and raised her to life, we read this in Mark 5 and verse 41. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And then when he went to the widow of Nain's son, and he died, Jesus went alongside, touched the, the coffin, and he says in Luke 7, 14, Young man, I say to you, get up. Little girl, rise up. Young man, rise up. Let the little child within you, the child that loved to laugh and play, let that little girl, that little boy, loose in your life. You see your stuff. Oh. Do you know, I'm so glad when I got baptized, I got baptized in water. Some people, I'm absolutely so sure they got baptized in vinegar, <laughs> lemon juice, or something. But I believe that Christians should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. Why? Because of this. Psalm 16 verse 11, you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Or the King James Version says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are the pleasures forevermore. Why do people not see that joy? 
in the life of the majority of Christians that they come across. Am I in the right room? <laughs> we, this is what it says, we're filled with joy in His presence. And this is not just when we get to heaven, we're in His presence now. Somebody prayed it this morning, there were two or three gathered together in His name. He is there, and in His presence, Hallelujah! Hey, let it, let it go from there to there and then back to you. In His presence is fullness of joy. And what a joyful place to be in church. It's a happy place. And even when I'm on my own, I'm not out of His presence because He has promised, I will never leave you and never forsake you. So when I'm on my own, in His presence, <laughs> there's fullness of joy. So every day is a day for play. Yeah. I know some people say, well, you know, the Messiah was prophesied he would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Yes, I believe that, absolutely. But I don't read in the Bible that Jesus was ever a man of misery wallowing in despair. In fact, I read something entirely different. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9, it says that God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Yes. Contemporary English version says he's made you happier than any of your friends. I wonder if that could be said about you. Wonder. You're a happy person to be with? Do people like being in your company? Or you when you go to the canteen at work if you want to sit on their own because no one wants to be near this miserable dip. <laughs> joy. It's contagious. Little children loved being around Jesus. And you know full well that little children are not attracted to grumpy people. <laughs> you get near a child like this, and they're off. You get near a little child with a smile, and they're oh. yeah. Little kids love coming to Jesus. Yeah. That tells me he was a man that knew how to smile, even though he's going through the most desperate thing on earth even when he was going through the whole road to the cross Jesus knew what he was of joy he knew the fact that the joy of the Lord is your strength he knew that why have we allowed people to equate Christianity with misery I think it's only from what they've observed in the past One day when we were living in Spain, when you know, what we used to do some dull things really, well not, just inclusive things for people. And we used to run classes on different things. And one class we used to run was uh, for the ladies, help them to keep fit. It was a kind of a dance fit class. So Christian music going, and they do all the, you know, the physical tricks and stuff. And they loved it. I mean, they were wobbling about all over the place. And uh, <laughs> so we just finished this dance fit class, and we'd gone to Iceland to uh, do some shopping. And um, I was at the checkout, and when I was at the checkout, I saw this girl, a uh, member of the church, Teresa. She'd just been in, in dance fit class as well. So I was at the end of the checkout, said, Oi, Teresa! <laughs> I'm walking around dancing. So, <laughs> who should be at the checkout? Or well, not the checkout, but just sitting near a little bit of a, like a cafe place at the end of Iceland. And there's a gentleman sitting at one of the tables in a cafe. And he called me over. And he and his wife are from another church in the town. And uh, I don't really know whether he was being serious or not, but this is what he said to me. I don't think the Christian should be having fun. I said, what? Then I must be the wrong job. And we should... I have been criticized for opening our Sunday services in, in particular ways. I would start off with a, a kind of a humorous story or a joke for people and, uh, and uh, <laughs> because people relax when they're feeling better, when they're feeling happy. I say things like the local vicar and his wife went to, to lunch at the home of one of the church members. And it was little Bobby's turn to set the table, you know, giving some things to do. So he was only seven years old, but he set the table. And when it was time to sit at the table, they noticed that the vicar's wife didn't have a knife and fork at her place. 
When mommy asked Bobby why he hadn't put a knife and fork out for the vicar's wife, he said, I didn't think she needed any. Daddy says she eats like a horse. <laughs> But I honestly believe that it is important to maintain a cheerful spirit. Modern, modern medicine is only now catching up with that fact, with that principle. And the Bible's been saying it for hundreds of years. In fact, we're reading Proverbs 17 and verse 22, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Take a spoonful. It's good medicine. Mm. A cheerful disposition not only makes you feel good, but it has a positive effect on others too. Yeah. People are more attracted to, sh to cheer than to misery, so we need to learn to play a bit more in our personal lives, even at church. Happiness is contagious, yeah. and it helps us to live life with a capital L. In fact, Jesus said, and we looked at it last week as well, I came, this is the message, I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. So we learned to play. And then the next thing that came up was this. Make their day. Notice, make their day. Not everything is about you or me. As Christians, we are dealing in service. Service to God and service to others. The church is the greatest service industry in the world. We think that we come along so people can serve us, so look after me. We become like these little mini birds, sit in the nest, look after me, care for me, pray for me, help me, deal with this with me. Me, 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 me. Church is not a mini place. Church is a place where we meet the needs of others. We need to meet the needs of one another. It's a service industry. We're serving God and we're serving our fellow man. Did you notice what one chap said in the video clip? He said, we noticed that we could make a difference for people. When they come by, they leave in a better mood. Come on. How many times have you left church? Thinking, man, I was depressed when I came in, but now I'm almost suicidal. <laughs> they leave in a better mood. Yeah. I'm not denigrating the serious stuff that we should be talking about. But I'm saying, here we're talking about things that affect us. Make they day. Don't be so concerned about yourself that you lose sight of other people. And the fact is that if all of us were determined, in here today, all of us were determined to make someone else's day, everybody in this place would be blessed. Because you decide I'm going to make that person's day look okay. You're going to say, I'm going to make that person. So everybody would be blessed. As long as we don't look at what can, what's in it for me, but how can I make their day? We're serving people. So learn to love it. Learn to enjoy service to others. It's a radical thought. Be nice to people. Just be nice to people. If you love your job, it shows. Whether your job is running a huge corporation or sweeping the streets. Whether it's preaching and teaching or taking the offering. Whether it's praying for the sick or cleaning the toilets. A servant heart we rejoice in making their day. Yes. Because the focus is not on himself or herself, but on others. And in Romans 12 and verse 10, we are told, oh, that's what bloke said, I forgot to put that up. <laughs> to honor one another above yourselves. Yeah. The message says, learn to practice playing second fiddle. You don't get much of that in orchestras, do you? You don't want people on the second fiddle, you want them to be on the, the virtuoso. They want to be the number one. If it weren't for the, all the people playing second fiddle, that person wouldn't sound so good. Learn to play second fiddle. It's not always about you. How about right now, make up, make up your mind that after this service, you are going to be a blessing to someone. 
It might only take a smile and a handshake. It might take a hug. It might take an arrangement with a cup of, cup of coffee for five minutes during the week. But you're going to make someone else's day. Make their day. The next one, quickly, is be there. What do you mean? I think we need to be with people in the now moment. People sometimes find it difficult to converse with others or to know what to say. I've had it in churches. People come to me, oh, can you go and talk to someone? I don't know what to say to them. I, I would know how to react to that kind of person. Can, 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 you, can you go and do that, please? Very often, it's not how do I talk to people, it's how do I listen to people? Can I be there for them? Instead of them being there for me to target them, can I be there so that whatever they need to offload, they can offload it onto me? We must learn to give people our personal attention. Be with them as you speak to them. Not looking around for a better conversation. I'll never forget Wendy was in a conference at one time. And um, she came back and I'd been with the ministers doing something else. And she came back and she said, oh, I, I really upset her earlier on. I said, what's the matter? Well, there was somebody there that was speaking to her. And um, he knew who I was and so he was talking to, to Wendy for a bit. And then somebody more important walked past. So he immediately shifted from speaking to her to, oh, I need to... And she was left thinking, well, aren't I important enough? Yeah. We've been in the middle of a conversation here. Yeah. And now you've just switched to attention. You weren't there for me. Mm. We need to be there for people. When you're talking to people, don't look beyond them looking for a better conversation. Engage with them. Yeah. Let them know that you're there for them. Yeah, you might have to listen to some stuff that needs a bit of processing, but be there for them. Never look beyond the person you're speaking to. Let them feel valued. The philosophy of the fish market is simply this. The people we meet are all future customers. And if they don't buy today, they may tomorrow. People that you are here for today might come back again. People you ignore or disdain or upset probably won't. I remember seeing this some time ago. People may forget what you said and forget what you did. Yeah. Never forget how you made them feel. See, so the thing is this as well. When we meet people for the first time, just remember you never get a second shot at the first impression. We have to be there for them. Now, this is not about fish. But the fact is that everyone who comes through these doors could become a future friend. Yeah. Everyone who comes through these doors could become a future member of Oasis. Mm. More importantly, whether we never see them again on this earth, just so as being there for them, being good examples of the life of Jesus, we might meet them in heaven one day. And they will walk up and they'll say thank you yeah. for the time that you spent just to be with me on that day. We need to make best use of the time that we have. Ephesians 4, 5, sorry, verse 16. Be very careful in how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Message says, so watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. And then the last point is to choose your attitude. It's not only choosing to be there but choosing what attitude you bring with you when you're there. Be optimistic. Choose to be happy. Don't worry. <laughs> be happy. Be happy. It really is a matter of choice. Do you know it's within my power? I can choose to be kind or I can choose to be spiteful. I can choose to be a participator or I can choose to be a spectator. I can choose to make others feel good, or I can choose to make sure they suffer hell that day. My choice. I'm not asking people to be unrealistic, or false, or live in some kind of fantasy existence. But as a result of all my other choices, I can actually choose to have a good day, or I can choose to have a bad day. Things do not always go as planned. Others might have already made their choice to wreck my day by things that they do or by things that they say. But just because others have made a bad choice, 
doesn't mean to say that I have to make a bad choice. When things go wrong, we can choose to react badly or well. It's still our choice. Choose your attitude. The man called Viktor Frankl, he was in the, one of the concentration camps in Germany, very badly treated by some of the guards. And one day, as he was being treated, badly treated, one of the guards said to him, why, why don't you react? Why, why, are you, why are you so calm on things? He said this, the one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. The last of one's freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. John Maxwell, great motivational speaker, says, the greatest day in your life and mine is when we take total responsibility for our attitudes. Yeah. That's the day we grow up. Yeah. You're responsible for your attitude. I don't care what other people do to you. I don't care what other people say to you. You are responsible. You can either respond well, or you can respond badly. It's your choice. Mm. Choose your attitude. It's best to choose your attitude before things start to go wrong, so you're not reacting out of desperation or weakness, but acting from a position of strength and determination. Mm -hmm. If we don't, or rather we don't have to adopt the same negative attitudes as others, and we don't have to allow their negativity to spoil our day, or our relationship with them, or with others. Love them anyway. What should determine our guidelines for attitude? Again, it was all this that Victor Frank, oh, worth reading again, look at that. This is what that guy said. The one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. Yeah. The last of one's freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any, <coughs> any given circumstance. And that one by John Maxwell. The greatest day in your life and mine is when we take total responsibility for our attitudes. That's the day we truly grow up. What should determine our guidelines for attitude? It was prayed, I think you read that this morning. <laughs> Philippians 2 and verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus think? What kind of attitude would Jesus hold? Attitude, just like happiness, is contagious. Is yours worth catching? This is not about fish. In reality, it's about evangelism, spreading the good news. And those who spread good news should not be bad news. One last thing, two actually. I don't know whether you noticed another couple of statements in the fish video. Here's the first one, catch the energy. We all have something positive to use in reaching out to others. We just need to thank God for what we have, not complain about what we don't have. Yeah. Oh, I can't do this like that. I can't. What can you do? Do it. What do you have? Do it. Catch the energy. I've only got little energy. That's okay. Put it into, into practice. Yeah. The second one was release the potential. Turn it into positive action. Energy is of no use unless it is used. Potential energy is just that. If I hold that, by definition, physics lesson coming up, this now has potential energy. The potential energy is determined by its mass and by the distance it has from the flow because that determines its, its velocity and its acceleration as I let it go. But while I'm holding it there, potential is that's all it is. It might be of use. It's only when I drop it, you feel the effect of it. Yeah. It's only when you let it go. When you use it. If you, you might be, oh, there's an incredible potential as a, I don't know, as a singer, as a musician, as a, well, are you practicing? Do you, what, what do you do with it? Because unless you're doing something with it, potential means nothing. Let it go. Yeah. Be prepared to release it. Mm. It has to be released to actually make a difference. So let's be determined to take what we have and use it positively in the service of God to others. <coughs> this is not about fish. It's about reaching people with the good news of God's love. Let's make up our minds by the grace of God to play more. Have fun. Rejoicing in God's presence everywhere. Make their day. Be good to people. Make them feel 
valued. Make their day. Be there. Sorry. Share their joys. And their sorrows. And choose your attitude. And make it a good choice. May hey, God bless us. As we go about our fishing. Share with people the great love of God in Jesus Christ. Father, just bless your word to our hearts today. Help it, Lord, to take root. And I pray, my God, as it takes root, so also in time it will produce fruit. In Jesus' name, for your honor and for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for being such a good God. Thank you, Lord, for filling us with joy in your presence. Help us, Lord, to share your life with others in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening.